Thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, thanks as well to those of you who are joining us on VC. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm one of the folks uh, here who works on our uh, space-related products in our 20% time, uh, Moon, Mars, Sky, and so forth. I'm here today uh, with the great privilege of introducing uh, an astronomer extraordinaire uh, who works at the Vatican Observatory. When I was first telling people about this talk, I was struck by the number of people who weren't aware that there was a Vatican Observatory. Uh, we live at a time in America when there seems to be a sense that science and religion are fundamentally irreconcilable, but the, the Vatican Observatory has been proving that idea wrong for centuries. Uh, here to talk about uh, that relationship between science and uh, religion and the practitioners of both uh, is Brother Guy Consolmagno, uh, who is uh, astronomer at the Vatican Observatory and author of a number of books uh, and papers and so forth, both related to astronomy and to the relationship of science to religion. Uh, there are a couple of his books down up front if you want to take a look and uh, learn more about what he's talking about. Uh, without further ado, I uh, give you uh, Brother uh, Guy Consolmagno. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Before I get into the talk itself, I wanted to give you a little film clip uh, to tell you something about the Vatican Observatory, just so that you have a feeling of what it's about. And this was a film made at our observatory last September when we dedicated the new Benedict observatory. Benedict XVI blessed the new headquarters of the Vatican Observatory. It's a new set of buildings about a mile from the old headquarters south of Castel Gandolfo. The Pope was accompanied by the Jesuits that direct the observatory. They showed him around the new installations, telescopes, and pieces of meteorites from their collection. The Vatican Observatory changed its headquarters because it required more space to accommodate the large number of students and researchers that work there. Before, the observatory was in the summer residence of the popes, but for security reasons, the number of visits were limited. The new center has a conference room, more classrooms, a library, and a space for the Jesuit community that's separate from the space from students and researchers. Though large part of the activities of the observatory are done at another center in the Arizona desert, the observatory in Castel Gandolfo is still a point of reference for astronomical investigation. With their observatory, the Vatican is securing a place in the area of world astronomical research. Well, two stories about that little visit. The observatory has been in its current form since, say, 1891. We've moved a number of times. We've most recently moved into these beautiful new quarters, which are air-conditioned, and uh, the Jesuit residence upstairs has more than one shower. It's, we, we used to be in the Pope's home, which was a castle built in, 18, in 1590 by Maffeo Barberini, who later became Pope Urban VIII, who was that Pope who called in Galileo. And Maffeo Barberini's residence now is an astronomical observatory, which is kind of nice. But the Pope, when he came, first of all, wanted to know about the piece of Nakla that I showed in the Mars meteorite. Of course, he wanted to know how it came from Mars. And I explained to him, as I'll explain to you, epicausa della isotopi che si trova nella... At that point, we switched to English. The other thing was, at the end of the talk, and as he's going out and shaking hands of everybody who works there, you know, this is a typical head of state come to visit, he shakes my hands and he sees my hand with the big ring and he says, I didn't know you were a bishop. I said, I'm not a bishop, I'm only a brother. I'm an MIT graduate. <laughs> <laughs> a month ago, when I was buying this suit, exactly the same thing happened. I was at the Vatican department store I walk in, the guy says, you want this size, hands it to me, don't bother putting it on, trust me, it fits. And then he said, oh, we've got these wonderful bishop robes. And I'm like, no, 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 it's an MIT ring. He goes, MIT? Bishops he has by the dozen, but he had never met an MIT grad before. <laughs> so there's a wonderful thing about having a brass rat out there. What I want to actually tell you about in this talk began not with science, but science fiction. It started at a science fiction convention in Chicago about seven years ago. And it was after you know, a long, fun, exhilarating day at the convention that an old friend of mine from my MIT days and her husband caught up with me with a surprising question. Could you explain to us how you make this religion thing in your life work? OK, now, they, they understood that a person like me who's a Jesuit brother and an astronomer could exist because, after all, I do exist. But they wanted to know, in a very practical way, how? What are the nuts and bolts of how I make my religion and my science all work together? 
and they were interested in it. They were interested in religion at this particular point in a way that they never were when we were all just punk MIT engineers together, is that they were getting older, they were raising a family. And they were asking me, because along with me being a Jesuit and a friend, I was also, like them, a techie. And they got me wondering, actually, what does religion look like to a typical techie? Now, what's a techie? A techie is someone who makes their living as an engineer or a scientist, sure. But it's even more than that. It's someone whose orientation to the world is pragmatic, logical, functional, where an artist is going to ask, is it beautiful? Where a philosopher is going to ask, is it true? The question behind a techie's worldview is, how does it work? Techies see the world in terms of processes to be understood, jobs to be done, problems to be solved. And there's a common assumption out there that most techies are atheists, or at least skeptics, and you know, no doubt, obviously, a lot of them are. But equally, a lot of them are not. With these endlessly boring debates between science and religion, there's a simple fact that often gets overlooked. An awful lot of scientists and engineers also happen to be churchgoers. And even the non-church attendees are living in a culture that is saturated with religion. And they and we are fascinated by it. I'm, I'm on a, a, a listserv with a bunch of friends who are mostly engineers and science fiction fans in Chicago. And a couple of the people on the server, are, on the list, are uh, Orthodox Jews. And there's more fascinating questions about how do you make this rule work? How do you do that? It's not an issue of religion. It's not an issue of belief. But just, ooh, a set of rules. How do these rules get applied? This is cool. A few years ago, I was invited to uh, lead a certain Bible study group in, I'm thinking, yeah, Catholics, we don't do Bible study, thank you. A Bible study group in Houston. I'm going, oh, especially in Texas, we don't do Bible study. A Bible study in Houston with a bunch of astronauts. Astronauts, I could do that. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, it turned out half the astronauts in the group were Catholic, so much for that. But there was this one guy who was not a Catholic who volunteered to me that he wanted to clear right up front he was a seven-day creationist. You know, strict, he was solid in his belief. The universe was absolutely created exactly the way it was described in the Bible, word for word. And, you know, I wondered to myself, like, had he ever actually read Genesis the bit where it says the world is flat and there's a dome and water above and below the dome, you know. Where does the shuttle go? How come it doesn't get wet? And then he told me what he had done for a living before he was an astronaut. He was a test pilot. And it hit me. You know, there's a, a test pilot is not the kind of guy you want who's going to creatively interpret his written instructions. There is an awful lot of jobs where a rigid literalism is actually part of the job description. You just don't want those people to go with you to the Museum of Modern Art. And part of that comes out of our techie culture. And in fact, there's a bigger issue underlying this literal mindset, more than being able to puzzle out the subtle meanings of scripture or the subtle meanings of, of paintings. It speaks to the serious misfit between the typical techie and the typical church. A hundred years ago, for example, the Catholic Church in America was the Church of Immigrants. It was a blue-collar church. It was a church of factory workers, laborers, and a lot of the things that the church was set up to do were dealing with the problems and the issues and the mindset of being an immigrant, being an outsider, having to work 12 hours a day to support your family. So you had you know, big emphasis on, on schools, big emphasis on getting people to, to rise ac uh, economically. Nowadays, the economy of the world is dominated by high tech. I don't have to be here to point that out to you guys. And thanks to all those Jesuit universities, a lot of the laborers of 100 years ago have grandkids who are now 
people working at places like this. The children, the grandchildren of the Polish immigrants and the Irish immigrants and the Italian immigrants. Unfortunately, I don't see a whole lot of evidence that my church is responding at all to the needs of techies. Um, religious instructors, retreat directors, the kind of people I ran into when I left my technological job and, and joined the Jesuits, they spend an awful lot of time trying to develop what they call the affective side of our personality, which most of us we hear is, you know, I don't want to be affected. No, no, that, that's not what they meant. It's the part that speaks to our hearts, our innermost desires. That's challenging enough for a poet. For a techie who has no idea what the hell you're talking about, such preaching just sounds like gibberish. A techie friend of mine described once he was going to a retreat, and the retreat director said, image yourself as a rose bush. So he's thinking, I guess, guess the, the retreat director said, you know, realize that you can be both a beautiful flower and pretty prickly and thorny at the same time. I don't know what they were thinking. My friend spent the entire time saying, okay, what kind of rose bush? What kind of image? What would be the right f-stop? <laughs> Another case, an engineer friend of mine decided he wanted to marry a Catholic. He figured, well, maybe he ought to be a Catholic. So he asked me to be a sponsor, and I went to all the classes with him, you know, the RCIA, the Religious Something Instruction for Adult. I can't even remember what it stands for. And there was a nun who taught it and, and been really good in talking a whole lot about how you can learn to appreciate and, and get to know how God loves you. And my engineer friend, week after week, was getting more and more frustrated. And finally, after about a month, he said, okay, what's with all this stuff about God and love? What am I supposed to do? When are they going to tell me the rules? <laughs> and that's the techie question. How does it work? Well, you know, if you're going to talk to techies, you, you go where the techies live. So in April and May of 2005, I was doing a Jesuit program called tertianship, which is a kind of spiritual sabbatical that Jesuits take after you've been in the order 15 years or so. And so I actually moved up to Santa Clara University. Uh, you recognize this is Silicon Valley. You could probably see yourself there. I spent six weeks driving up and down US 101 between San Jose, San Francisco, interviewing friends and friends of friends and friends of friends of friends, scientists and engineers, anybody who said that they'd be willing to talk to me about their religious beliefs or their lack of belief. I probably talked to about 100 different techies at the time. And out of that, I collected 25 stories that are in the book and I want to share some of them with you. Um, all the names are changed so that I don't embarrass too many people and so I didn't have to get their permission to use the stories. I'm really embarrassed because one of the people is, that I wrote one of the stories about is in the audience now and I didn't ask his or her permission. But um, <laughs> that's all right because I spent the morning with Brian who's the uh, science comedian. He was complaining about how people still steal jokes and I'm thinking of all the jokes I stole that are in my book. <laughs> but. These things, you know, one more thing to talk about in confession next week. <laughs> the, uh, the names have been changed and they're in alphabetical order in the order in which I interviewed people. So, it's Tuesday, it's mid-April, I've taken the Caltrain and the Bard up to Berkeley, and I'm sitting with Alan and Beth, an astronomer and a medical doctor. They're in a shambling hundred-year-old house in some lumpy furniture. House is full of character. There's this explosion of toys and books, only some of which belong to their kids. And Alan and Beth are church shopping. Just like my friends from MIT, they're facing the same issue of choosing a religion for their family. The needs and the desires of the kids are what's driving the issue. Kids are growing up pretty fast. Not a whole lot of time. It's a decision they can't put off much longer. So, what are the product features that you're looking for in a religion? To Alan, the intellectual content of the religion is what's important. Beth says that what she's looking for is more emotional content to the liturgies, you know, chants and drums, that sort of thing. But it's clear that Alan would be put off by bad liturgies and Beth by fraudulent theology. Beth is looking for a sense of mystery. 
which she says she feels lacking in the Unitarians that they visited. Alan was raised a Unitarian. He also describes him as kind of sterile. On the other hand, Alan was put off by the Quakers as being too flaky. Uh, Beth notes, maybe that's just the, flake, the Quakers you get in Northern California. <laughs> the editor of my book was a Northern California Quaker who got a good laugh out of that. And yet, even to Alan and his desire for an intellectual foundation to their religion, the core beliefs of any given religion are not so much things to be believed as only as things to be not disbelieved, things that are at least not unbelievable. They're not looking for a religion that's closest to the truth. They don't think they can make that judgment because they don't know the truth. They can't make that kind of fine dis distinction. They just don't want to belong to a religion that's obviously wrong. So what religions do they think are obviously wrong? I ask them. Since that interview, I've gone around, asked people all over, I'll ask you guys. Two religions, including the two my friends came up with, are always mentioned as obviously wrong religions in the mindset of a techie. Any guesses? Scientology, Scientology number one. <laughs> Absolutely. The other religion that they thought was obviously wrong, if you're a techie. Mormons, number two, which is really odd because my thesis advisor at MIT was a Mormon. So it's clear that there are a lot of Mormons who are techies, but for the non-Mormon techies, Mormonism looks really strange. And I think they're used to that fact. The features that you go looking for when you're shopping for a religion depend on the functions you're asking the religion to perform. You know, if a religion's supposed to bring you closer to God, then that implies a deeper question. So what? Why would you believe in God? To the techie, the question isn't so much a search for the proof of God's existence, but rather, even if God believes or not, what's the benefit of bothering to care if God believes or not? And after a lot of these interviews, I find believing in God is useful to a techie, very pragmatic, because... For one thing, it answers Leibniz's famous question, why is there something instead of nothing? It's not the only answer. It's not the only possible answer. But it is an answer that works. Oh, OK. For other people, other techies, it's useful because having a religion allows you to orient yourself in the universe. It gives you the benchmarks. It allows you to have a direction in life and to know whether you're making progress or not. And for some people, it's just a response to those questions you have at 3 in the morning when you're wondering, what's it all about? What am I supposed to be doing? And how come nobody's told me that? It's, it's what, what the theologians call a longing for the transcendent. More from my notebook. Um, Carol and David, both are scientists at NASA Ames. I'm sitting in their home outside of Mountain View. It's a Wednesday evening. It's about a week after I'd been up to Berkeley. Carol and David are older than my friends Alan and Beth. Their home is more sparsely furnished. Over a mantel on the uh, fireplace, there's two framed pictures, his adult kids and her adult kids. Now, Carol describes herself as a liberal Methodist and David as a non-believer. And Carol says that she uses her belief as a way of orienting and structuring her life. And as she says, Believing in God makes me a better person. That's why I continue to believe, which sounds like a very functional answer. But to both of them, the most compelling reason for belief is, in fact, that internal urge that makes you look for the transcendent. Even David admits that he can be moved in uncomfortable ways when he's attending church with Carol on you know, Christmas and New Year's. But David is still an atheist. And he says to me, you know, I was raised a Presbyterian, and in my early 20s, I went to this uh, you know, youth group in my Presbyterian church, and one day, after, the minister brought in a rabbi and a Catholic priest. And they were both really good. And actually, our minister was really good. But I was, realizing, I was very puzzled, because I realized they can't all be right. So it seemed to me the only logical possibility is that none of them were right. Now, when I tell non-techies that anecdote, they break out laughing. 
When I tell techies that, ad that anecdote, they go, yeah, I can see the point. <laughs> I feel it myself, even though I understand why it's actually not logical. It does say something about techies make snap judgments about new theories. But it also you know, approaches a fundamental puzzle to the techie mindset. If all religions are trying to get you to relate to the same one true God, how come there's so many of them? So I talked to a guy at the Santa Clara campus. I'll call him Ian. Ian is an engineering professor. He's Eastern Orthodox Christian. He teaches a course for engineers that examines religion using the mathematical theory of chaos. OK. To him. Different religions are different series approximations to the truth. Um, I don't think I have to explain what a series approximation is here. You know, some religions converge on the truth faster than others. Some actually get close for a while and then diverge. It's a classic case of using techie language and techie experience to make sense of religion. The trick comes up again day after I talk to Ian. I sign out the Jesuit community car, not that. <laughs> uh, drive up Route 101 almost into San Francisco and then peel off into the rather ordinary suburban neighborhood of South San Francisco. The only thing that tells me I'm not back in Detroit where I grew up is I can smell the salt from the ocean. Driving down a street of cookie cutter houses, in front of one is a VW microbus up on blocks. It says free Huey on the side. You know, it's a, something to do with Huey and Dewey, I don't know. No fire sign theater fans in the audience. You guys are way too young. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm calling him Jules in the book. This is the one guy, he's so distinguishable that I realized I had to get his permission. And I was originally going to call him Justin, and he said, don't name me for a boy singer. So he's a science fiction fan. I'm going to call him Jules. He's a Caltech graduate. He makes his living as a professional photographer. He combines artistic talent with his techie abilities in the darkroom to produce these incredible visions of nature. And they're all around us as we're sipping tea in his living room. I remember I, I went in and he says, would you like some tea? So we go into the kitchen. He opens the kitchen cabinet and there are 27 unmarked jars of little leafy powders. And he says, every one of them is tea. And this is, it. I'm assuming every one of them is tea. And uh, you know he could tell, OK, I'll take the Lapsang Sushong. Fine, great. Which Lapsang Sushong? Yeah. We're surrounded by a 1,000 vinyl record albums, dozens of paintings, a couple of original cartoons by artist friends of his. And he's sitting there in this big, wide, bright Hawaiian shirt with a big peace sign on a chain that's peeking out from underneath his beard, except the shirt's a whole lot wider than it was in 1968. Mm -hmm and the beard's a lot grayer. But other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back in time. And I describe my project to him, and we talk about it for a while. Like me, he sees himself as a techie, but a techie plus, a techie plus someone who's part of the community and yet able to step out of it and look back and ask questions from the outside. So being a couple of techies, we start enumerating all the different ways you can approach the question of why are there so many different religions. We come up with five classes of ideas. Number one, they can't all be right, so they must all be wrong. You know, my friend David, the astronomer. Number two, they are all right. They're just different descriptions of the same thing. All churches must be equally true because they all teach essentially the same thing. Content equals rules. If all your churches come up with the same rules, they must all have the same content. And therefore, they're all the same. Uh, I saw that in a friend of mine who was a seventh day. How do I put this? He had been raised a Catholic. He left the Catholic Church because it had way too many rules. Then he married someone and joined her church, and now he's a seventh day Adventist. Talk about too many rules. Number three. Different religions are like different computer operating systems. Which one's right for you depends on how you're wired. In other words, the choice of the religion you follow depends on your personal history, your internal needs, your genetics, the general question of what you're trying to get out of the religion. And that's not the same as saying they're all the same because there is one religion that's right for you because you're worried why you're different from the guy over there. And like different computer operating systems, 
Some religions have more features than others, but at the cost of a higher overhead <laughs> and the greater possibility of bugs. That sounds like my friends, the church shoppers. Um, number, I'm actually getting ahead. You know, number four. Different religions are different approximations to the truth. Some approximations converge faster than the other. And we heard that before. That's different from number two or three because it suggests there actually is one religion that converges the fastest, that really is better, at least in a functional sense, if not necessarily truer in the long run. And number five, different religions are like different kinds of physics, you know? Aristotelian physics is perfectly common sense, but it actually isn't very accurate, and it's a whole lot less useful and powerful than Newtonian physics. And most engineers get by fine with Newtonian physics, but in the long run, in the really difficult cases, Newtonian physics fails. And then you have to go into quantum physics, and who knows, maybe there's steps beyond that. So people have different religions and seem to get by just fine with different religions until they come into one of those places where the less true version fails them. Of all the five versions, that's the only one that says, at the end of the day, only one religion really matches the truth in all of its completeness. We can argue, of course, about which religion that is. Um, I'm a Catholic and a Jesuit, and you can kind of guess where I came from, but I happen to know a lot of techies who would give you a good argument in the other direction. I talk to students, to professors, to young Turks, to senior executives, to theoretical scientists, to engineers, a lot of differences among them. But I do see a lot of common pattern in my interviews. The typical techie has serious questions about truth and religion when they're in college. It's usually a he, of course, so there's more women techies today than they used to be. I have this picture up there. Did anybody here recognize what that is? You betcha. That's the, uh, the MIT chapel, and right behind it is the dorm I lived in. Uh, you can see my room with the large speakers in it uh, off to the left. <laughs> That's Bexley Hall. I, I gave a talk once with a bunch of MIT types and said, you're wearing a collar like that and you lived in Bexley? I go, well, yeah. He goes, boy, you really did take drugs seriously when you were there. <laughs> um, what can I say? Not true. OK, so the typical techie has serious questions about truth when he's in college. A lot of them abandon organized religion at that point, though they never necessarily totally abandon the search for God. And then they get married. Maybe they start a family, and they wind up going to church again, usually the wife's church. It doesn't matter if the wife or the husband is the techie. It's usually her church. However, even though they're back in church, they still never let go of their skepticism, just as when they were out of church, they never let go of their desire for God. Techies who are old enough to be parents are the ones most likely to be coming to church, but they don't go there to ob obtain their values or to obtain their idea of what's true, because by that time, they think they've already got that. Basically, what they just want is to be in a place where they're comfortable in dealing with those values and truths, you know, to be challenged, but not too much, and a place that will help them to pass those values on to the kids. The kids, on the other hand, can be skeptical of organized religion, but they might still see reasons for believing in their desire to find their sense of meaning, to help them discover what they're supposed to be doing with their lives, to deal with those big questions of self-identity and defining their own ideas of truth and value. Meanwhile, there's a lot of other aspects of religion that seem to me would be especially appealing to a techie, but they're, they're downplayed in religion nowadays. For example, the church, my church, and in various ways, Christian churches, can claim a historical connection to Jesus Christ and his initial, immediate followers, something that is called apostolic succession. You never hear anybody in the church talk about that anymore. But in fact, that guy in the pulpit, wearing the funny suit, who doesn't know how to make the microphone work, was ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody. And you can actually trace back all the way to the original people 2,000 years ago. And if you're Jewish, you can do it even farther. That 
sounds like arguing from authority and arguing from I've got the power and you don't and therefore very unpopular in American culture, except when I had a bunch of scientist friends of mine visiting in Rome and you can buy a poster in Rome that lists all the popes by name and you know, presumably pictures of the ones we have photographs of. And a friend of mine was just blown away. You can actually do that? You can actually name all of them in a continuous line? And I go, well, yeah, you know, it's you know, mean value theorem. It had to come from someplace. <laughs> this very, uh, this sense of historical credibility is so powerful that there are skeptics who spend an awful lot of time trying to disprove the line. They say, oh, well, you made up that one in the middle. You, made up. you know, I really don't care if you made up the one in the middle or not. That's, as I say, the existence theorem tells me that there was a chain. I don't have to know the names. In fact, the magnificence of St. Peter's Basilica itself, which is often an embarrassment to American Catholics, and cited a real religious experience. Another scientist was visiting me. He had uh, come to Rome. He, was, he had brought an instrument. We were going to observe an occultation. And we had a couple of days free, so we went and you know, did the tourist sites, going to St. Peter's. Before he set foot in St. Peter's, he had described himself as a fallen away Unitarian. <laughs> Halfway into the church, as he's looking at the building, he turns to me and he goes, Guy, the people who built this, they really believed this stuff. I go, well, yeah. You know, and, he, and he's shaking. And I'm thinking, you know, there are drugs to help your problem here. But <laughs> he went home. He joined his dad's church, his Lutheran church, became really active in it. He's now teaching everybody else how to behave, just as he was teaching them all. How to... It's fascinating. The power expressed in the immensity of St. Peter's, like the apostolic succession, is tied into this greater issue of authority. Ministers in church, typical churches are very often afraid of coming across as too authoritarian. They want to you know, project a humility. They want to say, well, you know, I'm just one of you guys. They tend to want to downplay their ordained status, the fact that they actually had to study something to begin a minister. The trouble is, to most techies, if you think about it, Authority carries an enormous importance and respect. Everybody in this room is an expert in something. Damn it all. I know it better than you do. And if you're saying, you know, I'm a doctor, not a metaphysician, damn it all, Jim. It's because I am a doctor. And I respect that authority, and I don't like being called on to being something else that I'm not. And I respect anybody else who is an authority in what they do. And I expect them to know their stuff. And if they come on to me saying, well, you know, I'm just kind of hacking this together and I really don't know what the hell I'm talking about, you're likely to take them at their word. Then why should I bother listening to you? Why should I listen to some guy in a dress up in the pulpit who doesn't know how to make the microphone work? It's interesting, but I suspect one of the reasons why Jesuits do well in techie settings is because everybody knows we've been way overeducated. You know, the typical Jesuit priest has the equivalent of at least a master's in theology and another master's in philosophy, along with whatever it is that they've studied, you know, in my case, a PhD in planetary science. And so you can say, okay, talk to me about the stuff you know, and I'll listen. Try to tell me something about stuff you don't know, and I'll squash you. Fair enough. Uh, there's actually a whole thing in the gospel about uh, the, 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 the centurion who says, I know how to give orders. And he says to Jesus, I know where you can give orders. In that same sense, that sense of authority is something that I swear more religious people should get from anybody who's actually trying to tell them something about religion. Tell me why you know. Tell me what you've studied. And I think that's a legitimate question that you should ask Unfortunately, it's tough to go into a church and ask that because the guy you're going to ask it is going to see it as an attack rather than as the honest question that you and I are really asking. Back to my notes in Silicon Valley. May 9th, I'm jumping way ahead. I'm talking to Xavier. <coughs> Xavier's 28 years old, self-described atheist. Um, this is the cathedral where he works. <laughs> no stranger to religious and evangelical sales pitches. 
no stranger to the sense of the power of a centralized authority. <laughs> he also tells me that, you know, he thinks most people use membership in a church for that sense of community. And, you know, at his time in life, he doesn't think he really needs that. Okay. But through all of my interviews, I've been getting the sense that here we have this marvelous theology in the Catholic Church and nobody's bothering to take advantage of it. They're joining the church for, you know, the, the potluck suppers and, and the religious education. And my friend Xavier says to me, people are not going to church for what you're selling. You think you're selling truth. Your customers already have truth. They don't want truth from you. What you're selling to them is tech support. <laughs> so, is your priest or minister or rabbi just somebody you call in when things are broken? Or maybe you go there for once a week scheduled maintenance? Still thinking of repairmen, I head off to lunch the next day with the ethnologist Julian Orr. Now, this is his real name. He used to work at Xerox. He studied the anthropology of office workers. He spent a year dressed up as a Xerox copier repairman, living with Xerox copier repairman, writing his doctoral thesis at Cornell, which he turned into this book talking about machines. He's retired now. He's raising sheep on the hills outside of Half Moon Bay, but he was coming into Stanford to visit his acupuncturist, and so we agreed to chat over a Middle Eastern falafel that you get in a street cafe. And at this point, I've been in Southern, Northern California for two months, and this all seems perfectly normal to me. <laughs> He tells me how Xerox copier repairmen are given thick manuals about how to fix the machines, but in practice, the manuals are utterly useless. Machines never break the way they were expected to break back at the home office. There's nothing in the manual about what to do when somebody leaves a bologna sandwich in the paper feed. Instead, what they do is they sit around Denny's waiting for their beepers to go off, and meanwhile, they trade stories. There is this deep oral literature about how I fixed this and how I fixed that and how I was able to cut a piece out of this tin can and wrap that and made it work. And what they do is that they take the book of rules and they back engineer from the rules to an understanding of how they think the machine must be working. Because nobody ever bothered to tell them how the machine worked. All they got was this book of rules. And then it hits me. Isn't that the way that religion-practicing techies deal with the rules of their religion? They, over, they agree with the overall general goals that they hear from the churches, even if they don't have a whole lot of respect for the documentation that describes how to reach the goals. And just like with a Xerox copy or repairman, there is this unspoken contempt of people who just follow the rules blindly, and even more of a contempt of the suits who insist on such a behavior. Just following a cookbook implies you don't understand the underlying technology. And I find exactly the perfect illustration of this point a few days later. I'm in a Denny's again, as it happens. I'm talking to Yaz. Now, Yaz is a scientist in his 40s. He's a devout, active Lutheran, rather conservative one. He's pretty contemptuous of what he refers to as the bobble-headed Jesus that you get in some churches. He wants serious content to his church. He finds the presence of liturgy and Sunday communion important, but he doesn't really go on about ritual in general, except in one instance. He says the most meaningful liturgy he ever experienced was in fact his own civil marriage to his gay partner. So there he is, an active and committed Lutheran, attempting to live, living in, a permanent committed gay relationship, and I can see the way the gears are working because, you know, I know his church doesn't recognize such relationships, but his church does teach that sexual relationships should be monogamous, should be committed. That's exactly what he's trying to do. As far as he can see, he's following the rules. Even if they aren't the rules that are in the book, they're rules that he's invented for himself in a sense, but they're rules that match the bologna in the sandwich problem that he was faced with just like the Xerox repairmen provide customer satisfaction with repair procedures that would never make it into the official manual. There's a side to all of these conversations, though, that surprises and impresses me. 
It's the commitment that all of these people have given to their various faiths. You know, we techies only have so many hours in the day. One way you deal with the fact there's so many different things we want to do is to multitask. So you share science fiction books or fantasies, you play games, you listen to music, you go to movies. Yeah, that's a play time when you can relax. That's a time when you're with friends. That's also a time when you can contemplate the big questions of life. You know, what are the kinds of games in literature that are appealing to us? Role-playing games, fantasy and science fiction, games that are conducive to self-reflection, games that allow us to examine our own goals and identities, to allow us to the distance to feel comfortable in doing all of the above. You know, when you're immersed in a fantasy novel, when you're struggling with the hero's ideas of good and evil, when you're listening to Wyndham Hill music and you've got a high-tech sound system, when you're I, imagining yourself in the, the life of an itinerant monk in a role-playing game, hope you have enough hit points. These are the techie versions of meditation and prayer. But meditation and prayer is a spirituality, which is slightly different from religion. So what's the role of religion in life? You know, is it just another lifestyle choice, uh, Starbucks versus Pete's? I think to a lot of non-techie religions, that's the way it comes across. I recall when I was thinking of joining the Jesuits, I was showing some of their literature to a techie friend of mine who had known through the SCA. And uh, she was an atheist, but she was looking through all this stuff and going, hey, I could see why this would be really appealing. I could see all these great buildings you live in and these marvelous libraries. And yeah, this looks pretty cool. You know, except for all this God stuff here, I could get into this. <laughs> going back and reading all of my interviews with all the people I talked to, reading between the lines, I have a hunch that those techies who do belong to a church, it's more than just lifestyles or communities. You know, you're getting something there that you don't get out of a bowling league. Techies do have a religious life. When they go to church, it is for something more than what they get out of going bowling. It is precisely for the God stuff. It's just that they, we, have a very deep reticence about talking about it, even to a trusted friend, even to a family member, even to themselves. You know what it's like here. If you bring up, if you are religious, you're not going to talk about it because either they're going to misinterpret you as some guy who's trying to push your religion on the other fellows, or they're going to be somebody who's going to want to push their religion on you, which is just as bad. Or you're going to be misunderstood, or frankly, it's none of your goddamn business. It's not something you talk about in this setting. And I think that's completely reasonable. It's something that also makes it very hard when you move to a culture where religion is something you talk about, whether it's the Deep South or I remember in Kenya, the first three things people would ask you is, you know, what is your name? What is your tribe? What is your religion? If you ask them, are you married and have families, they get very upset because their family and their wife, that's very private. Why do you want to know? But they'll happily tell you about their religion. It's just a cultural thing. And this is the culture we're in. And yet, because I had the collar and the MIT ring, I was allowed to bring these questions up to my friends. And they were allowed to speak knowing that I was just, you know, I wasn't even taking notes. I was kind of memorizing it and typing it when I got back. I'm not making any judgments in any of them. I'm just curious. The thing that got me when I stepped back after the two months is, you know, there was not one person to whom I asked my questions about religion who looked blankly at me. They all knew what I was getting at. I wasn't raising anything new that they hadn't already themselves thought through, regardless of where their answers came out. There's, there's one more wrinkle in all of this. In this world, in this technological universe, in the technological vastness of the future we're living in, curiosity about the world is a basic human trait. Denying it denies one's humanity. And the ability to understand the world in a scientific sense empowers the individual. It gives you a habit of mind that looks for cause and effect, which a lot of poor people don't have. They think 
crap happens, and that's all there is to it. Rather than saying, why did it happen? What can I do about it? Or what can't I do about it? So don't waste my time doing that. Go someplace else. Technology shows us how impossibly big problems can be broken down into smaller, solvable problems. The ability to understand technology, the ability to be a techie, is a social justice issue. I was in the Peace Corps. I got fed up with astronomy one day when I was 30. I quit my postdoc at MIT. I said, I want to go someplace where I'm useful. So six months later, I'm in Africa. And what do they ask me to do? Teach them astronomy. <laughs> Why? It's because astronomy is one of those things that makes us human beings and not just well-fed cows. You know, I've got a very, very clever cat. But my cat has never wanted to look through my telescope. If you deny that to somebody, you're denying them their humanity. OK, a lot of techies are not really good when it comes to talking about feelings. Tough. It's true of a lot of us. I think the church has to learn how to speak to us. And I think those of us who are techies and members of a church have a responsibility to talk to our church people about talking to techies. Because you're the guys who have the cred on both sides of the aisle. You know, set up a telescope in the church parking lot at night and let kids look through the telescope. Give a talk on Sunday afternoon on the theological implications of Unix and Linux. <laughs> Whatever. You know, how can a church expect to reach techies except to meet the techies where they live? And maybe you can each even teach the minister how to make the damn microphone work. Remember, Jesus himself was a techie. It's not just that Jesus was male and single and smarter than everybody else around him. <laughs> and when he tried to fix the world, he got crucified. <laughs> Consider, the word technology comes from the Greek word techne, which to the ancients represented the mere mechanical fashioning of the physical world, as opposed to the more exalted idea of being a philosopher or priest. No wonder that Jesus the carpenter was about as welcome among the Pharisees as a plumber at a philosopher's convention. You know, my fellow techies, we feel just that alienated at times. But still, some of us believe. Yeah, we're just mechanics. We're God's mechanics. Thanks a whole lot for having me here. And oh, I should mention my, the couple who I'm talking to, their younger son just got into MIT. All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Is this on? Yes. OK. So we have time for just a few questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone if you have a question so that those on VC or in their future watch, watching a video can hear the question. Uh, and uh, it, not just about this, you may want to talk about your own experience. Or maybe you want to ask me about meteorites or astronomy or why isn't Pluto a planet or, you know, <laughs> throw it out there and I'll do what I can. Noel in the corner has the first question. Let me just bring this over there. So one of the logical conclusions of your talk is that we need a new church that actually gets closer to the truth and <laughs> is appropriate for techies. Um, the very question implies the truth as if it was a one-dimensional aspect. I think there's lots of churches out there that are close to truth but are doing a really awful job of communicating it. More than once, I've had you know friendly settings where I'll talk about Catholic belief and at the end they'll say, well, you make it all sound really reasonable, but I know Catholics really don't believe that because that's not what I see in the papers. And you do have to realize that the only topic that gets more poorly covered in the news media than religion is probably science and technology. OK, next question. So as an agnostic who's married to a Catholic and raising a young son who's going to be raised Catholic, this was a very interesting talk to me uh, on, a, on a personal level. Um, at one point you, you spoke, though, of how the church could stand to kind of emphasize its uh, almost heritage, the, the lineage of, of expertise. And I think one of the, the potential flaws in that argument isn't necessarily that uh, 
the, ch the church isn't that doesn't necessarily have the right answers or or isn't necessarily an expert because there's this long line of expertise it's because it lacks a certain degree of independent verification that someone else you know someone from outside the church can't necessarily look at that and and judge independently or it's difficult to judge independently whether or not they're correct yeah they uh, that's again treating church as technology and um, I would say that the advantage of going to a church for a philosophical body of knowledge is the same as the advantage of going to MIT rather than buying a copy of Halliday and Resnick on your own and trying to page through it. In theory, you could do the latter, but it's not a very efficient use of your time. The other point of my expertise argument is that if the church itself recognized what it is an expert in, it might be less likely to try to speak on the things that it's not an expert in, which has damaged its credibility in lots of areas. And so I'm, I'm saying this as, you know, I'm, I'm not speaking to the right audience today about that. I'm saying this most, mostly to my fellow church people, that you guys will listen to somebody if you have a reason to believe that they know what they're talking about. Give us the reason to believe and, you know, uh, people have, uh, you know, one time somebody asked, how can you be a Catholic? You have to believe everything the Pope says infallibly. And well, no, that's not papal infallibility, which is in fact very, very narrow. I'm one of the few guys who I can say to my boss, you're not infallible about all those other things, unlike many of us. Um, to be able to know that a lot of these questions have been thought through and implications are there that we don't have time to get to on our own and that there are twists that I would never have thought on on my own, not because I'm stupid, but just because I've got other things to do in my life. That is the utility of belonging to an organized body of knowledge. Okay, in the back here. Hi, I'm a lapsed Catholic, and I have two small children. My husband and I are thinking about starting to take the kids to church, but I don't agree with the church's stance on birth control or gay marriage, and I'm just wondering... I don't know, how do I overcome that? Because it's a real problem for me. Um, an awful lot, I mean, and, and rather than aiming at those two points on a thing that's going to be, you know, recorded. <laughs> <laughs> where all I can say is I'm very sympathetic with the problems. Um, number one, look at the people around you who are living that life. And I'm not one who has to, you know, I've never had to deal with those issues. So I don't have the answer. But in general, the body of the church and what it's teaching is more than any two or three data points. As a scientist, I look for the entire cloud of data points. I try to see where the center is. I try to see where the uh, inherent uh, systematic biases are going to be. Where is it coming from? Who are these people? What's important? And a number of things where I don't have the answer, because frankly, even if this wasn't being recorded, I don't know that I have the answer. Um, you know, on gay marriage, I've, I've gone around at least 720 degrees on that one. And I'm probably still spinning, because I can see where, where I got it. I can see, but I can see, but I can see. And as I get older, I tend to be more conservative but more tolerant, if you understand how that works. The way that uh, the St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order, put it is, Take what comes from the church and try to read it in the most positive light that makes sense with your experience of the universe. What are these guys trying to say? What is it that they're afraid of? Are the fears legitimate? But at the end of the day, after you've read, after you've studied, after you've prayed, you have to follow your conscience. And I can say that and being recorded, and nobody's going to get me on that because that's a fundamental point of Catholicism. Catholicism is not following a bunch of rules. As someone else once said to me, the church doesn't have rules, the church has teachings. Rules, you follow the rules or you're not playing the game. Teachings, you go, oh, I never thought of that. Okay, but then you still have to go back and apply it to your own life. Okay, any more questions today? Nobody wants to know about Pluto. <laughs> I was on the committee that demoted Pluto. That's why I mentioned it. He has an entire treatise on his website, actually, with his position. It, 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 it's, it's all Vatican plot, you know that. <laughs>
Uh, all right, then, if there are no more questions, uh, let's all please uh, thank Brother Galakasamani one more time. Thanks for having me here.